Hi guys, this is Drew from the Cellcast, and uh, what you're about to hear, of course, if you've been following along, is the re-release of our animated series segment for Star Trek Lower Decks Season 3, Episodes 3 and 4, which are uh, Mining the Mind's Minds and Room for Growth. These two episodes, we recorded our reviews for them on our Muppet Family Christmas episode, uh, of course, we're doing all this so you can get ready to uh, listen to us talk about Star Trek season, Star Trek Lower Decks season four, uh, which we're releasing our first episode, which is actually the Strange New Worlds Lower Decks crossover episode on Labor Day weekend. So keep an eye out for that. But yeah, here are your episodes for the, for for uh, this time, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. <laughs> Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission, to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Come on now and set sail for the future. Find the sky, I'm sorry, I just love that song. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, first oh, episode of tonight yes. is Mining the Minds Minds. That's a tongue twister. Mining the Minds Minds. Minds. Get it said right in a second. Uh, this episode is directed by uh, Phil Mark Sagadraka. I hope I said that right. And written by Brian D. Bradley. In this episode, on a remote science outpost, stone orbs are bringing fantasies to life, while Tendi starts her first day as senior science officer trainee. Guest casting, or guest casting, the guest cast for this one includes Lauren Lapkus as both Jennifer Shrayan and Werewolf Jennifer. Werewolf Jennifer. That's how it listed it. Agreed. Ben Rogers as Steve Stevens and the patient in sickbay. Ah. Carl Tart as Core D and the Borg Snake. The Borg Snake? You forgot about did, the Did Borg I snake. miss this? <laughs> the one that shot the basketball at them in the cave? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I was like, what the fudge is so going you, on? I, I just, that's the thing about this particular episode. If you have not seen this, everything I've just said sounds like chaos. It does. And it is. <laughs> Paul F. Tompkins as Miglimo and... It just says young. <laughs> young. <laughs> young someone. <laughs> I don't remember who. Uh, Baron Vaughn as mayor and Carrie Walgreen as Kearns. And a special guest star for this episode, Susan Gibney as Dr. Leah Brahms, mm -hmm. which I'm guessing you I have no, no idea, idea who, who is. that is. <laughs> so the character of Dr. Leah Brahms is a leader in warp field theory and contributed to the development of the Galaxy-class ship's warp drives. Ah. That's who the main idea behind this character is. Uh, she first appeared in the Next Generation episode, Booby Trap, mm. as a hologram that Chief Engineer Jordy LaForge accidentally creates in the process of trying to figure out how to have the Enterprise escape an energy trap. Mm. Basically, every time the Enterprise, the Enterprise got stuck in this one location, and every time the Enterprise would do something to kind of, you know, start the engines to move out right the whatever was causing this would suck all the energy out of the drive and keeping the enterprise from moving oh that's what they were trying to get past uh turns out that the hologram program is a little too good as holographic brahms and Jordy start to develop feelings for each other throughout the episode oh. by the end of the episode when Jordy has to turn off the program it plays like two lovers saying goodbye to each other oh if Jordy would have been smart, he would have deleted this program. However, 
in the next generation episode galaxy's child which mm. was in the following season okay the real dr leia brahms comes on board to study the enterprise uh, to the enterprise to study the engine modifications Geordi has made over the years oh as the enterprise is heading through an asteroid field they get attacked by a space-born life form defending themselves the enterprise accidentally ends up killing this life form which turns out to be pregnant and after performing the equivalent of a c-section to save the child the child decides that the enterprise is its mother and attaches itself to the ship feeding off the warp drive oh fun as Jordy and brahms attempt to figure out how to quote unquote sour the milk to make it disengage leah comes across the holodeck program from booby trap oh and you can imagine how that went specifically when we see Jordy comes in and finds dr brahms facing herself it is the scene is the scene from the her final appearance in booby trap where she says Jordy, when you are working on my uh, i am in these engines when you are working with them you are working with me oh and something God. to that effect it's like oh wow this is like the worst place you could have come in on <laughs> like i think i'll be like Jordy, like get beam me up scotty now yeah uh so yeah that's who dr leia brahms is gotcha uh the also in the ep in the episode we see a kuku khan the snake flying snake monster okay uh, which previously appeared in the animated series episode House Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth. Okay. Fun fact, if you've seen uh, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, Kuku Khan is the name that the that the uh, the Mayan people that uh, mm -hmm. Namor is from call him because they believe him to be a representation of oh. their god. It, it, they are based off the same source material got if it. you're trying to figure that one gotcha, out gotcha 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 uh the psychic minds that appear in this episode produced a similar effect as the technology used on the shore leaf planet from the original series episode shore leaf mm. and the star trek animated series sequel once upon a planet as well as the fantastical alien illusions experienced aboard deep space nine in that episode in their episode if wishes were horses this episode features the first appearance of the Excelsior class USS Hood and the Excelsior class in general in animated form. The USS Hood first appeared in the Next Generation at Premiere Encounter at Farpoint. The appearance of Cordy is the first reappearance of the Zaldan race since the Next Generation Season 1 episode Coming of Age, which aired 34 years previously. Hmm. This episode references several past incidents experienced by the Lower Deckers aboard the Cerritos, including Boimler and Rutherford's descriptions of that Klingon who took off, the, took off with the ship when he was drunk from Envoys, the time they tussled with Mugatos in Mugato Gumato, mm. the two times that they tussled with the Packleds, mm -hmm. No Small Parts and Wedge Dudge, the time they scared the crap out of that drill instructor in I Excretus, mm -hmm. And the later description of the, by the Carlsbad Lower Deckers to the time the Cerritos Lower Deckers stood strong in an alien trial, which was later clarified as more of a party yeah. in Veritas. Uh, this episode included the use of a hand phaser to heat rocks, <coughs> much like was accomplished by Sulu and was first seen in the original series episode, The Enemy Within. Mm. Stevens mentioned that when he was turned to stone, he was... He declared brain dead, but saw a koala sitting on a black mountain. This is a reference <laughs> to the episode's moist vessel, where it is mentions the universe is balanced on the back of a giant smiling koala. Remember the one the, the guy was trying to ascend, but was actually oh. faking it. But oh. then he does ascend and we see him. He says, the 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 universe is ruled by a giant a koala. Why does he smile? What does he know? <laughs> you don't remember this? I remember this. I remember this. Uh, wow. Uh, where it switches the universe is balanced on the back of a, of a giant smiling koala. And we'll always have Tom Paris, where Shax mentioned it during the explanation to Rutherford about how he came back to life. Yeah. Which we never got a full explanation for, and I'm fine with that. Yeah. 
Uh, that's the end of the trivia for this one. What are your thoughts on this episode? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was like, this, like, I, I, there again, limited understand, limit, limited exposure to all of Star Trek. Trek, yeah. Trek, right? Trek, Trek, Star Trek. There's an E, not an A. Okay. Star Trek. Oh my gosh. Either or, moving on. <laughs> moving on here, people. For I embarrass myself even more with Star Trek stuff. Moving on. Moving on. Um, oh man, that's just the the fact that they they encounter these rocks that will make you uh like your your deepest fantasy come to life and that's turn you starts to stuff. anyway, huh? That's how it starts anyway. That's how it starts anyway, then it turns into a nightmare, which I find I, hysterical. I especially love the Klingon clowns. Oh god, it's <laughs> the bat left arms. <laughs> Those were funny. Those were funny. Uh, the part that got me more was uh, Tindy trying to be insertive or trying to, you know, buck up to the captain. It's like, mm-hmm. hey, I, I just found it very interesting. I, I found that more interesting than the the I guess you would call the the main plot. I guess this is actually I think one of the weaker episodes this season. Yeah, I would agree. I'll admit because it's the one that's the most off the wall. Yeah. Well, outside of maybe the next one, but um, yeah, I, I I see what you're saying. How Tendy's trying to uh, be more assertive so that she can try and be a senior science officer uh, will be a more interesting story. Yeah, and also her fact to be like she's the one who picks up on the uh, the the transponder. Yeah, They're like oh, there's a weird frequency going on here, and everybody's just ignoring her, and she finally just is like enough, and just smashes this thing, revealing the. Uh, the, the power community. source, the, huh? The power source, the power inside. source, where these two people are communicating, or they're working together to get more information from Starfleet, the rock, thought, huh? the rock based life forms, and the outpost scientists. I thought that was clever. I thought that was clever. <laughs> the end of it was great. The like the psychedelic, uh, all the monsters are trying to kill you kind mm-hmm. of thing, gonna turn you into stone. That was funny. But the Tindy story was better, was more better, yeah. was a little more fleshed out. It was a little more intriguing. But yeah, I real I enjoyed the episode. It's a little weak with its. I think it's a plot. It's B plots better. If they would have stuck more with the B plot, I thought it would have been better. Yeah, I agree with you there. Right. Actually, uh, I don't think this was the best way to use Doctor Leia Brahms's character, even though I get the joke. It being a reference to how she is, how uh, her first appearance, basically. Right. Um, and that apparently a lot of engineers have the same type of fantasies, I guess. Weird. Because uh, that's the entire reason Rutherford had a fantasy on her, because Jordy had a fantasy of her. It's like, yeah, you know, these are different people. Yeah. I, I get maybe he could have a crush, but still. It's like, oh, yeah, we we all have, like, you know, our crushes on this character. I'm like, Really? Yeah, just, I, just because she created the warp core, <laughs> she didn't create the warp core. She just made it made it better, better. basically. Made it better. I really don't know a good way to explain it because wow. she's just a leader in the field, and she's the one who technically created the Enterprise's warp core. Yeah. Uh, but see, I don't really think using this character, using the character in this way, mm-hmm. is was the best way to handle using her character. Might have been funny if Rutherford had had to deal with her on the Cerritos because maybe yeah. the Cerritos is using the Enterprise D's design since it's a newer ship than the D. And so maybe it's using technology that was made for the D yeah. for, for that for the Galaxy class. But uh, and maybe it causes trouble with the California class. Maybe. So maybe Rutherford would have to work with her on that and maybe that could cause some issues and problems. Maybe. That might have been a better use of her character other than Oh, I'm just a I'm just a fantasy dream sequence thing. Yeah. And granted, I bet you that uh, the actress had a lot of fun playing this. Probably. Scene. I almost guarantee it. It's just I kind of wish. There's sometimes the jokes get in the way on the show. They do. even though it's meant to be a comedy. Right. They're just sometimes it's like you could tell a better story that is still funny if you just work a little bit better at making the coherent story first. Right. 
but yeah i agree with you that tendy's story i think is done better in this um and maybe they just couldn't think of any other good jokes besides the idea that um in reality dr taana is actually her mentor instead of miglimo yeah even though miglimo is her official mentor yeah but then who likes miglimo for being honest true he's like he is paul f Tompkins, so comparing him to shorty does make a lot of sense that is true so but true. it's like if shorty was actually intelligent very true which really explains a lot about that character uh but yeah this is just i, I this is not my favorite episode of season three i do think it's the weakest one in season three uh, but it is a, it is just a nice little fun episode agreed uh you ready to hit the next one yeah let's do that next episode room for growth which was directed by Jason Zurich and written by John Cochran. Uh, in this episode, Mo Mariner, Boimler, and Tendi clash with their arch rivals, Delta Shift. Meanwhile, the Cerritos engineers go on mandatory relaxation leave. And that goes about as well as you think it will. Asif Ali plays Asif in this one. Mm. Mary Holland it plays Taz. Charlotte Nick Dow uh, played Meredith and Moxie. Artemis Pebdani played Caravitas. And of course, Paul Shear played Andorithio Billups and Carl Tart reprised his role as Kayshawn. Which I actually liked a lot of his uh, sayings in this one from his language. They were funny to me. Gotcha. Uh, getting into the trivia for this. Two additional background characters introduced during season one are given names for the first time in this episode, that being Fedorov and Moxie. The opening scene where Captain Freeman is possessed by a mask and turns parts of the Cerritos into an ancient temple yeah. is a direct reference to Star Trek The Next Generation episode Masks. Which is about as stupid as you think it is mm -hmm. from what you saw in this episode. <laughs> Except it's Data that gets possessed by the masks. Yeah. It's a weird episode. Agreed, it is. Oh, you've seen it. What? This episode? Yes. No, Masks. No, I haven't. That's what I'm saying. That's the weird episode. Oh, okay. I thought, this is referencing this, that episode. Yeah, this is a masks. weird episode, too. Yeah, but I mean, the whole thing with the masks is okay. what I was referring to. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Taz and another unidentified masseuse are the third and fourth Adosians to appear in Star Trek after Eric's in, from Star Trek the Animated Series and the Division 14 medical specialist from the Lower Decks episode, Much Ado About Boimler. The Gallardonian, a member of Momol species, a member of Miglimo's species, hmm. and a member of Attix's species. I mean, the idea is how many species have not been named yet. Right. All species first introduced in Lower Decks appear aboard the Dove. Huh. Uh, it is confirmed in this episode that Dr. Ta'ana at one point had a tail like all other Cations. Oh, gosh. Earlier in her Starfleet career, she lost it in an unspecified incident. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that scene... That entire scene, I'm like, oh last, my god! Last but not least, one of the Dupler emissaries' duplicates, oh, skeletal god. remains, can be seen yep, when it. Mariner, Boimler, and Tendi first enter the area under hydroponics, suggesting at least one duplicate was unaccounted for. Or, well, there's not a lot of oxygen down there, so no. I get it. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> Tendi. Ten I, I, I like Tinley as a character more and more because she's a little more assertive than yeah. she used to be. Oh my gosh. This I'll, episode and this episode, the last episode in this episode, it's just more like, okay, you, you like Tinley more. Yeah. This is uh, another, uh, we also get to see another instance of uh, bold Boimler. In oh, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Except now we know him as anti Graph Boy. <laughs> That was great until it's like, oh, it's the Flecker dish. Ah, uh, crap. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about the holodeck scene. <laughs> oh, gosh. Why? Uh, it's, I, I understand these two are a couple. I get it. Yeah. This has been the running, not the running, but this, this has been going on since somewhere in season two is where it started. Yeah, it did where she realized she actually had feelings for Shax. Probably the episode where Shax came back. Yeah. For being honest. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, I, I love it. I love that this moment in there where they're 
robbing the bank. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely like Bonnie and Clyde all yeah. day, all day. I thought it was hilarious, and she's like, "It's like, oh, turn off all like uh, turn the safe, turn off the safety protocols." It's, it's like, hold on, and that program, and that is not what makes him pause the program. It's mostly like, you know, we never talk anymore. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm dying. We haven't talked this. Oh Here, I'll God. show. I'll tell you a secret. <laughs> Nobody knows how I lost my tail. Oh my gosh, Tiddly! It's like <laughs> I've got to know. Gotta, it's on I'm, start. It's like I'm curious. It's like no, nope, we don't want to find this out. Nope. But I do need to make a comment on one thing because this is another instance where money is brought up on Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Except this is money from the past. Yeah. So there's been a thought. That in Star Trek, the Federation does not have uh, any money. Okay. I disagree with this. Just because it's not seen on screen doesn't mean there's not money. Sure. For one thing, there has to be some sort of exchange rate to the Ferengi's gold press latinum, since that is a thriving currency mm -hmm. that pretty much everyone who wants to deal with the Ferengi has to be able to use. Yeah. And you can't replicate this stuff anywhere. That's part of the reason why it's actually still worth something. Mm -hmm. Uh there is nowhere in Star Trek that actually states that they don't have currency of some kind. Mm. The closest that you get is in Star Trek First Contact. Okay. When I, I know you've seen the movie, right? Yeah, I've seen it. Okay, you know the scene where he and or Picard and Lily are working their way through the ship, and she asks, uh, I had a hard enough time finding enough titanium just to build a four-meter cockpit. How much did this thing cost? Mm-hmm. And Picard says, uh, the, uh, the accumulation of money is no longer the driving force in our lives. Mm -hmm. People have used that quote to say that there's not money in Star Trek. That is not what Picard said. No. <laughs> Picard said the uh, pursuit and accumulation of that money is not the driving force in our lives. That may be true for Picard because Picard Picard's family is rich because they have a very old vineyard and he probably never had to care about money. And plus Picard's an idealist mm -hmm. and he's trying to, he's got, he has a chance to teach the ideals or his ideals of from the 24th century to the lower 21st century. And maybe this is where the concept of the quote unquote uh, evolved human that supposedly exists in next in Star Trek starts this is actually proven it's proven true but anyway not not important but wouldn't that be like understanding very little about star trek there's still money there's still money but wouldn't he be breaking the what is what is that code that they can't break? you're thinking of prime directive, prime directive but technically that doesn't count here because it's still a human race what comes into play is the temporal prime directive which oh. means you can't change the past uh. problem is by that point past had already been changed so he's trying to change uh to correct the problems uh, yeah. in the past yeah. and he and it's not the enterprise that caused the problems it was the borg, borg. sphere true that's what changed the past i got you uh i like what bobo says in our chat he says it's kind of like saying money is evil uh -huh. but it's, that's not the case it's the love, love of, of money, money. That is the problem. And yes. that's actually how it's written in the Bible. We always Agreed. say it's like money is the root of all evil. It's actually the love, of, love money. of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Yeah. It's it's that it's that driving force yeah. that be it's like, great. oh, I just want to make money. That's your yeah. driving force. Money is ambition. not evil. It's just money above all else is yeah, evil. Exactly. So yeah. So I I I this is a thing that's always gonna come up when because people are always saying Star Trek doesn't have money. I'm thinking that's stupid. Why else would Cisco's dad have a restaurant? Yeah. Just because he likes to cook. Do you realize how long it takes to cook? Uh, uh, yeah. a, run a restaurant. Mm -hmm. You were there all night. You don't do that just because it's fun. You do that because you're getting a paycheck. Exactly. <laughs> Even if it's a mighty big paycheck because you're the manager. Yeah. You still have to be up there during like the worst part of the day. So anyway. Yeah. Sorry. Had to get that off my, off my chest. Cause gotcha that topic is one that bugs me i got you anyway uh but yeah that scene is one of my favorites there in the bank and i love how uh boimler and uh mariner don't even know what don't, are not even sure what it is they don't even know how to pronounce the word bank 
It's like, yeah, we got all this uh, paper currency that has an arbitrary value to it. When you, when you think about it, all money is arbitrary values. That is true. It's, it's not, not really, backed up by anything. It's not backed up by anything. So, you know, I can't really disagree with them. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. But anyway, I've been talking a lot. You talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is interesting that they, it's like, oh yeah, the, 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 the night crew is going to, you know, steal all the glory. So they got to go and, you know, well, that, be it, their it, own so there's a, uh, a lottery for a new, for uh, new rooms that have opened up. Uh-huh. And they think that there are four rooms on deck one, one that are available, but it's only one room on deck four, which makes a lot more sense than four rooms on deck one, since the only thing on deck one should be the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> that is, is traditionally the only thing on deck one on like every other ship true except for the defiant because it only had five decks true and they actually in- tactically designed that ship so that the bridge was sunken into the superstructure hmm. but anyway either or be like i i do i do like uh kind of like this, the last episode it's more it's like okay they're on this little adventure and hold on what is the 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 side the b story to this uh, because I am Rutherford. To... Okay, technically, them going after the uh, room is the B story. Yeah. Okay. The A story. Is, oh yeah, the spa. Is spa. <laughs> the spa. That's right. I that's totally forgot about that. Technically, the A story, and I love how the engineers are fine. Really, I mean, yeah, yeah. they've been overworked, but that's just because they have the captain. Kind of stop. It's the captain who's gone nuts. And I'm just like risking get to you, but I'm like, okay, Cap, you gotta de you gotta uh uh de stress a little bit. And the the little DX6 Machia, they just come mm-hmm. up with a device that like literally puts Dove out of business. Right. It's like I need this to destroy, but why? This thing is all over. It's like get rid of this now. It's like yeah, because then we won't have. We'll actually have to work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I love all of their uh, the the things they show in there that were supposed to help de-stress, like the the puppy room. Oh yeah, the cat room for the deviants. When there's no judgment, it's like <laughs> I'm one of those deviants. <laughs> You're not kidding. <laughs> and then puppies the- rolled dogs cats drool yeah i disagree <laughs> um and then the the room with the klingon is just killing it is just breaking everything uh-huh. it's like act technically he's got over his time but we're all scared to go in there and stop it yeah you think <laughs> it's like not bet you are uh but I, I, that was all yeah that it's was like fun. quick increase the puppies we can't sir we've run out of them we even threw some buddies in there and it's not helping <laughs> That was, it was it was fun. It was to me. It's it reminded me of uh, Star Trek, not Star Star Wars on Clami- uh episode two. Clamino, Camino, Camino. Thank you. It's for some reason that just reminded me of that. Mine is not being a clone facility, but more of uh, relaxation. Spa. Yeah, that's just what it reminded me of for some reason. But uh, I I did enjoy the episode. I enjoyed more the the B story to mm-hmm. it. And of course, our characters don't win, and it's <coughs> there again. It's all miscommunication, or it's the uh, like where uh, I think it's Mariner. They start talking about how, like, where they're going to be in the next you know couple of years. Yeah, this character's going to be here. This character here, Mariner's probably going to be kicked out of Star, Star Starfleet at this point, and Mar- and uh, uh, Boiler's probably going to be dead somewhere. <laughs> I want to comment on Mariner being kicked out of the service, but I'm not. <laughs> but got it, <laughs> got it. Uh, I will. I do want to point one other cool little thing out that my trivia didn't show, but uh, the fact that the way the engineers relax is by doing engineering. That has been a running gag since the original series with Scotty. Got it. Every chief engineer tends to prefer relaxing by reading one of their technical journals mm. this is not a good scotty i don't think no anyway let's not going to get into that uh but yeah it's that's just a, it's, I, I loved the continuation of that running gag yeah it's it's like how 
with the with some very few exceptions, most of the good doctors are cranky. Mm-hmm. I agree. I'm still waiting for Doctor Taana to say something like, "You fool! I'm a doctor, not a su- such and such." <laughs> or he's she's he's dead, Captain. <laughs> I'm still waiting for that because it's like those are the traditional lines. Grant they're TOS lines, but uh-huh. still. Anyway, yeah, I always keep an ear out for those. Yeah, but yeah, I thought Actually, like they're they're interesting episodes. Other they're, things I keep an ear out for the number forty-seven, which we've not seen a lot of. Forty-seven. Forty-seven. Okay. The most common number in Star Trek. All right. Okay. Well. I- That'll be a discussion for another episode if it ever comes up again. Exactly. So yeah, uh, that's going to be the end of this one, I think. Yep. Uh, join us next time for the episodes Reflections and Hear All, Trust Nothing. Hmm. Okay. I believe Hear All, Trust Nothing is the episode that takes place on Deep Space Nine. Oh, okay. Excellent. A previous location oh. on the sh- in for, in Star Trek. So join us for that next week with the Polar Express. Uh, you got anything to add before we cut out of here? Uh, welcome to the Christmas train. In the meantime, this has been true. This is Jacob, and we'll catch you in the next frame. You can follow Jacob on his Facebook at Jacob B. Heron. His Facebook page, Jacob's Daily Art Corner, where he tries to draw each and every day. His Instagram at Jacob B. Heron. His Twitter at Jacob Heron. And his letterbox to Jacob Heron. You can find Drew on Facebook at Drew Dodgen. His Facebook page, Drew's photo bin to see his photography. His letterbox page at GGeorge759. His Twitter at GGeorge759 and Instagram at Drew Dodgen. You can like us on Facebook at The Cellcast Podcast, on Twitch at The Cellcast Gaming, on YouTube at Cellcast, on Twitter at Cast underscore Cell. The Cellcast can be found at Apple Podcasts, Google Play Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or anywhere else fine podcasts are downloaded from. Please rate and review us where you found us, and also on Podchaser. Email us at thecellcastpodcast at gmail.com. The Cellcast is a proud member of both the Pop Americana and Culture Box Media Networks. For more information, please see the link in the description. Our theme song is Drop and Roll by Silent Partner. And remember, that's Cell with a single L. Oh, brother, we got stuck in another elevator shaft again.